to get us started tonight, um, I'm going to give a couple options for people. So a normal thing that we do in the beginning of uh, traditional Buddhist teachings is uh, the teacher would encourage all the students to generate a particular type of motivation for attending and listening and learning these kind of practices. And um, I would first, if you're new to all of this, just come with whatever intention you came with. If your intention is just to hear what Buddhism's all about or what Namchak's all about, then that's that. But for people who may be already steeped in this tradition, I encourage you, and I will I will say it in a very traditional way, like the way that Ken Rinpoche would start every teaching, he would say exactly this. He'll say, um, I'm going to, you should think this is your intention, I'm going to listen to these teachings and then put them into practice so that I might be able to free all beings from suffering and bring them to the state of Buddhahood. And that intention is what we call the mind of bodhicitta. And so bodhicitta translates as the mind of enlightenment. And so the mind of enlightenment is the topic, um, the overarching topic of which this topic of the six perfections is a subtopic of. And so last month, if any of you attended, um, Lama Tsomo gave a talk about bodhicitta. And what we're going to be talking about tonight is something that is called um, the trainings in bodhicitta. So once you have thought about or generated this kind of intention of bodhicitta, which is the intention to free beings from suffering and bring them to the state of enlightenment, that is uh, the primary motivation in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, then if that is your intention, then you have to have some way to train. So... Um, when we talk about this mind of bodhicitta, we talk about two aspects of bodhicitta. I, Lama Tsomo talked about this last month, but I'm going to give a quick summary just to kind of set the stage for what we're going to be talking about tonight. And so when we talk about this mind of bodhicitta or the mind of enlightenment, um, what we're talking about is that intention I just said. And so there are two aspects to that. There's what we call conventional bodhicitta versus um, ultimate bodhicitta. So the conventional bodhicitta is that intention to wish for the freedom of all sentient beings, to free them from suffering and bring them to the state of enlightenment. Ultimate bodhicitta is actually what it means is the mind that sees or recognizes or realizes the ultimate truth. So that's not really what we're going to be talking about tonight, but I'm going to talk about that in connection with what is a perfection. Like what does the word paramita even mean? So First of all, when we're talking about this aspirational bodhicitta, or sorry, conventional bodhicitta, it itself, sorry to get into all these categories and subcategories, but that's the way it goes sometimes, especially in Buddhism. We have a lot of enumerations of phenomena and so forth, the six of this and the four truths and the eightfold noble path and the 16 aspects of the four noble truths and all this kind of stuff. We're not going to get too complicated tonight, but essentially you've got conventional and ultimate bodhicitta. Within conventional bodhicitta, you have aspirational bodhicitta, which itself is just the aspiration, the wish to free sentient beings. Then there's engaged bodhicitta, which means how are we going to actually do something about that? And so for the aspirational bodhicitta, um, it's often talked about as a commitment that you make towards a result. So what does that mean? It means I'm committing towards the result of freeing beings from suffering and bringing them to the state of enlightenment. So I'm making a commitment towards some far off result. You know, it's a pretty far off result to think I'm going to free all limitless sentient beings from suffering and bring them all to Buddhahood. So then engage bodhicitta means I'm committing to a cause. I'm committing to the cause that might bring about that result. So I'm committing myself to the practices which would actually enable me to do that, which would actually enable me to bring about that result of the liberation of all sentient beings and the enlightenment of all sentient beings. And that cause is this practice of the six perfections. So we often talk about the trainings in aspirational bodhicitta and the trainings in engaged bodhicitta. So the trainings in aspirational bodhicitta are things like um, the four immeasurables, exchanging, equalizing, exchanging self and other. And then the trainings in engaged bodhicitta, primarily when we talk about that, we, we, we talk about the six perfections. Also in many texts, um, they'll talk about methods for generating bodhicitta where it has not arisen. So there's a common prayer in uh, the Buddhist tradition that comes from Shantideva's way of the Bodhisattva, which says, the precious mind of bodhicitta, may it arise where it has not yet arisen, may it not diminish where it has arisen, but may it, may it increase ever more and more. And so a lot of commentaries to books are even split up into those three topics. The methods for how to generate bodhicitta where it has not yet arisen, the methods for how to sustain it so that it doesn't decline, and the methods for increasing it ever more. And so 
the four immeasurables are considered important in all three stages. So when you haven't yet generated bodhicitta, it's important as a method to generate bodhicitta. When you have already generated bodhicitta, it's a way for you to not lose what you've already gained to kind of stabilize that. And even once you've gained it, it's a way to increase it ever more. So the four immeasurables are considered important at all stages. They're not merely a method for generating the aspirational bodhicitta, but they are the main training for generating bodhicitta in the first place. When you don't even have bodhicitta, you have not developed that intention in the first place. It's the main method that we use to develop that. Then the main method for engaged bodhicitta is the six perfections. And those six perfections are the perfection of generosity, ethical discipline, patience, diligence, which sometimes gets translated as joyful effort. I'll explain why in a moment. Meditative concentration and wisdom. And so tonight we're specifically going to be talking about generosity. Um, and first I want to talk just a moment about what the word perfection or paramita means. So paramita literally means that which takes you to the other side. So uh, it means that you know, perfection is, is an interpretive kind of translation, but it's quite common to use that word. Um, in, some word in some translations, you'll see the, the six far-reaching practices or far-reaching attitudes or something like that. Um, and often you'll see just paramitas, just left as Sanskrit, because there's so many kind of explanations of the term. A lot of people choose not to translate it and just use the Sanskrit word. But at any rate, what it means is that these six um, practices... When they are, or I should say the first five of these six practices, when they are joined with wisdom, then they become a method which will take you to the other shore, meaning that they will take you out of samsara, out of a suffering or um, discontent, unenlightened state, and bring you into the state of enlightenment, the transcendent state which transcends this current state of suffering and ignorance and so forth. And so... That's where this word perfection or paramita comes in, is that um, right now, for example, if I were to, with my ordinary unenlightened attitude, I were to give um, $5 to my friend who, or $100 to my friend who can't make their rent this month or something like that. That is generosity, but that is not the perfection of generosity. So... That's where this wisdom aspect comes in, and that's a whole nother topic, which is quite a lot to talk about, and I'm going to briefly mention what that refers to and what that wisdom is, but that is a its own topic, which deserves its own two-hour lecture, which will come in five months. But essentially, um, if you've already done some Buddhist study, it refers to it refers to the realization of emptiness. It refers to the kind of realization of the ultimate nature of things. And when we're talking about an act of generosity, what it, what it refers to specifically is um, you'll often see this type of terminology in um, Buddhist texts, which means it is giving without uh, conception of the three spheres. This is Buddhist jargon. Um, so don't get too worried about what a sphere is or why it's round or what's the sphere or anything. But anyway, it's kind of three aspects. Just think of that. And what that means is that if I were to make that same act of generosity, I were to give my friend some money to, to cover the rent for the month. I don't have, I, I have gotten to a point where I no longer see, I'm no longer fixated on the true existence. I don't believe that I, as a, as a singularly solidly existing person, is real, like real in the way that I'm grasping it to become some kind of true and solid, ultimately existing thing. I also don't believe that about the object I'm giving, the money, nor do I believe that about the person who I'm giving it to. So I have seen the emptiness or the true reality, the lack of independent existence of me as the giver, the object, which is the gift, as well as the recipient. So it, one way they'll talk about that is that that person in that instance is giving in a dreamlike or illusion-like manner. So let me just tell you a little bit about what the opposite of that would be. If I believe that I'm real, I'm truly singularly solidly existing, I believe this money is truly solidly singularly existing, and that person is as well, then that whole act of giving is going to be tied up with a lot of grasping, emotion, fixation, potentially ego, or regret, or attachment, or hope 
for some kind of outcome. Like, I hope that person's going to be good to me in the future because I did something good for them. Um, you know, there, there's a lot more attachment, fixation, stickiness in that because I think I'm real, you're real, this money's real. That's a whole nother topic, and I know that's a lot to hear about right now just in those short, that short of a statement. But honestly, that topic of the perfection of wisdom and about the topic of emptiness and the lack of independent existence is like a topic that is covered, you know, I mean, for example, what, what we're, it's going to deserve its own full lecture in this, in this, in this instance. And I would also ask um, either Rachel or um, Allie to um, look at the uh, Awam Garden of a Thousand Buddhas website and copy the link to the video teaching of Ken Rinpoche teaching about emptiness into the chat. And I would suggest, if you want to know more about that topic, that you um, watch that video. It's a, a two-hour-ish, hour-and-a-half to two-hour video of Namchak Ken Rinpoche, who is my teacher and whose picture is auspiciously right above me. This was not planned. Um, <laughs> of him teaching about this topic of emptiness extensively and me translating. So um, that would be a really, a really great way for you to um, maybe – have a, a more full picture of what that word perfection means. I don't want to. I don't want to overemphasize that too much, though, um, because for the, for gaining a full context, a full understanding of what this word paramita means, it is important to know. But there's a lot about the practice of generosity and how it works in the Buddhist tradition that we can talk about without having a full understanding of that topic of emptiness. So it's not as if this whole topic is for nothing or that because you don't understand that one point completely that this is going to be a waste of your time. Not at all. So, But it is, you know, as a way of framing this whole picture, that is a, an, an important part. You know, if we're going to talk about the six perfections, obviously we need to talk about why is it called a perfection? What's the point of that? What's the difference between ordinary act of giving and a perfection of giving or the paramita of giving? So um, that's where, where that topic comes down to. And so um, now let's talk just for a moment uh, as we're still talking about the six perfections. Um, I'm just going to go through them briefly just to kind of mention essentially what they're about. And so the first one was generosity. And it sounds obvious. It's just giving, you know. There's a lot more to it, and we're going to cover that um, topic by topic here in a minute. But essentially when we're talking about any of these um, any of these topics then um, or any of these six perfections we're talking about um, methods which are going to help us to get to the state of enlightenment and the first five of those in particular are kind of methods for us to get to the point where we will be able to understand and realize the sixth one of wisdom which is that um, realization of emptiness or the realization of the act, absence of independent kind of supposedly true existence. So these first five, it's not as if you can't practice them without that wisdom of emptiness. You're actually practicing them as methods to get your mind ready to understand emptiness. And once you have understood emptiness, then they become perfections. For now, we're training in them, hoping to perfect them, Ultimately, these six, these five practices are going to serve as stepping stones or I'll, I'll think of more of ways of opening doors or, or opening knots in our mind to open us up to the point that we're ready to understand or realize the state of so-called true reality, emptiness, absence of independent existence. There's many ways of talking about that state. So there's a sequence of these. And... Um, the sequence, you know, is um, when we go from generosity to ethical discipline, ethical discipline is much harder to practice than generosity. Like, for example, it's much easier for me to give someone $5 or to give them my time or to give them a smile or to give them my attention or to – there are other kinds of generosity as well. There's a generosity of protection from fear like for me to break up a fight or something like that, it's easier for me to do that than it is for me to um, practice ethical discipline, which in general, just generally speaking, like um, we would talk about um, abandoning. There's, there's a category of teachings that, we, that are the Buddhist ethics and the, the kind of primary, most foundational one when we're talking about the practice of karma and abandoning harmful actions and adopting helpful actions something called the 10 non-virtues. And 
They're essentially like sexual misconduct, killing, stealing, lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, um, uh, harmful intention, um, covetousness, and wrong view. So anyway, these are like actions which are harmful to yourself and to others. And so for ethical discipline, what that means is to have a sense of restraint within yourself, that I'm not going to do those things. And it's harder to not do those things and to refrain from those than it is to give someone some money or to help someone out or whatever. Likewise, it's harder than refraining from those things. It's even harder to not get angry. And the essence of patience is not getting angry. It's having an undisturbed mind. And so patience in our tradition does not mean being mad, but not letting it out. It doesn't mean biting your tongue and holding it in. It means actually understanding and having an understanding or having a patience or having a meditative state, having a, a fortitude within yourself that you don't get actually angry, that you can not get, even, even if you feel the energy of the anger, you don't allow it to disturb your mind. And that's the essence of patience. And so patience is even harder to practice than ethical discipline. Likewise, diligence is even harder to practice than that. So, um, and now come back, coming back around to that word diligence, uh, often it's, you'll see it translated as something like joyful effort or something like that. I personally prefer the word diligence because that's a more literal translation. And the reason why I prefer that word is because at first you see the word diligence and it seems hard. And... But when you get teachings about that, when you understand what diligence means, it actually means enthusiasm. It means joyful effort. So when you hear that diligence is joyful effort, now diligence doesn't seem so hard anymore. It's just about enthusiasm. So like if you have enthusiasm, it's easy to do things. Like at first, it might be hard to get up and meditate because you're kind of forcing yourself to do it. But once you get in the flow of it, once you get the taste of it, once it starts to be kind of joyful, you have enthusiasm, it becomes easy. Then the next one is meditative concentration. So even harder than gaining that sense of, um, you know, joyful effort or diligence, it's even harder to keep your mind undistracted. And the essence of meditative concentration is a single pointed mind, an undistracted mind. And then even harder than that is to develop this wisdom that sees the ultimate nature of reality. And so we can think of it in terms of the one them being easier or more difficult to train in also in terms of more coarse or more subtle so like giving something or protecting someone is a more obvious or outer kind of action than refraining from something even more subtle than refraining from something is um, being able to control yourself and not get angry and so on and so forth so the practices become more and more subtle they also become more and more difficult to train in. But by training in the earlier ones, they prepare you to be able to train in the latter ones. So there's a specific sequence to these. They're not random. And it's not as if you should just train in one and not the rest um, until you've perfected uh, generosity that you shouldn't practice discipline or whatever. We practice all of them. But there is a sequence in that in, in uh, difficulty. They start off... Um, easier and become more difficult and they start off more obvious and become more subtle and so there's another way that we talk about the six perfections in that like in a simple manner like right now we could we could fulfill all the six perfections in this one act of you listening to me talk about the six perfections so like for example generosity generosity is you've given up your time to be here you are giving your attention to these teachings Ethical discipline is you're putting, maybe putting down your phone, um, sacrificing like other things, uh, refraining from um, other kinds of like maybe distracting and so forth uh, actions or, um, and kind of refraining from those things in order to be here. Patience, it may be a long session. You might have sore knees or a sore back, but anyway, you, um, you, you have the fortitude and the forbearance to, to be here and be present. Diligence, you come here with some kind of, uh, you know, enthusiasm or some kind of interest. Uh, meditative concentration is focusing on the topic at hand and not getting totally distracted by other thoughts or other, um, other things in your periphery or whatever. And wisdom, um, so wisdom from, from one perspective on the highest level, wisdom is this realization of the ultimate reality. On an ordinary level, the way that we talk about this term wisdom, which is better translated as profound intelligence, 
Um, it often just gets thrown around as wisdom, but wisdom, you know, in a Western sense is more of an accumulated knowledge that makes you be able to make good decisions or something like that. And that's not what it means at all in Buddhism, actually. In Buddhism, it is a, um, a very sharp discernment, a very sharp intelligence, which knows this from that. So, um, so in this sense, you know, listening to the teachings, thinking critically about them and becoming more clear about what these topics are, knowing this is this and that's that, is the aspect of wisdom. So in that, just even in this one action of sitting and listening to this teaching, um, you know, the six perfections are complete within that. And you can similarly apply that same presentation for almost any activity that you engage in. Um, and so... It's not, uh, you know, what I, my point in bringing that up is that the six perfections aren't necessarily some specific thing that you have to think about doing, but that they are the way that you carry yourself in a certain situation. And so um, <clears throat> there are, you know, there is more to it than that. For example, we're going to talk about specific types of generosity, specific ways of, of giving and so forth. There also, when we talk about um, ethical discipline, it, within ethical di discipline, as a traditional practitioner of Buddhism, there are particular vows that could be taken, like people take a refuge vow, um, you know, that is kind of a commitment towards certain practices, a commitment towards refraining from certain harmful actions and so forth. There's something called bodhisattva vows, there's something called tantric samaya or tantric vows. Those are all sub, uh, you know, particular aspects of ethical discipline. It could also just be you for yourself if you're not a traditional Buddhist practitioner. You're just kind of curious. It is people have their own sense of, of ethics, whether that is secular or religiously inspired. So kind of keeping and maintaining that is an aspect of ethical discipline. And so all of these things, you know, can be um, practiced in just day-to-day -day life. They're, they're not necessarily something that you have to think of as like some kind of like special spiritual thing. It's really just a... Um, you know, there are obviously things that you can focus in on, that you can try to improve your practice of, or that you can try and refine your understanding of and your practice of. Um, but they're not some far off thing. They're they're very um, tangible. They're very like uh, applicable to our day to day life. And so, um, um, let's come around to um, coming back to this idea of the perfection of wisdom and how that perfection of wisdom makes the other five perfections. And so there's a, a, a quote from one of the perfection of wisdom sutras. So that is the paramita. We call that the, the paramita sutras. There are a lot of those. So um, in translation, there's like the heart sutra is the most famous of those sutras. It is the most condensed um, of the paramita sutras, the uh, perfection of wisdom sutras. And that is the, the sutra which that video that um, Rachel or Allie put into the chat, that um, is the topic of that video. Um, and so there are more and more of those Perfection of Wisdom Sutras. There's a very shorter one, there's longer ones, there's the Perfection of Wisdom in 300 lines, Perfection of Wisdom in 8,000 lines, Perfection of Wisdom in 20,000 lines, the Perfection of Wisdom in 100,000 lines, which is like a giant few volumes of text. Anyway, all of those are talking about the topic of emptiness. And in one of the most brief versions of that, there's a quote that says, without a guide, how could even a trillion blind people who are unfamiliar with the road ever find the city gate? Without wisdom, the five perfections are sightless. Without its guidance, one cannot reach enlightenment. And so as a method for enlightenment, these five practices, the first five practices, are not going to get you to enlightenment on their own without wisdom. They might make you a better person. They might make you a more respectable person, a more um, aware person, a person with much better focus who can do their job a lot better, who might be more kind to the people around them, more generous, more patient, and so forth. But those things without the insight into the nature of reality, which is the perfection of wisdom, will not get you enlightened. So coming back around just to reframe this, um, all of this whole topic of the six perfections is talked about within this scope of the practice of bodhicitta. And the practice of bodhicitta is the intention to attain the state of enlightenment for yourself and all beings or to bring other beings to the state of enlightenment. So all of this is talked about within this perspective of a quest for enlightenment. They're not just some like, it would be good to be generous or it would be good to be you know, ethically restrained or whatever. It is, it, if you want to get enlightened, 
you should follow these kinds of steps. You should implement these kinds of practices. So that's the whole, just to reframe things and bring us back around. Um, just want to make sure that's clear. So, um, and in that, it's not as if wisdom alone will work either. So I said, without, without wisdom, those five won't get you enlightened. But wisdom without those five also won't get you enlightened. That's a problem. And so that requires a little bit of a description of what we mean by enlightened. Um, and so in Mahayana Buddhism, it's a little bit different than what they talk about in Theravada Buddhism. So um, I don't want to get into too much hullabaloo about the differences and all of that kind of stuff. But without talking about it, it's, it's tricky because Mahayana Buddhism often talks about um, something that they call non-abiding nirvana. What does that mean? <laughs> that means not, not remaining in samsara, but also not remaining in nirvana. And so that requires a bit of like clarification because it seems like, you know, on first glance, the, the enlightenment and nirvana are the same thing, or the whole point of this path is to attain nirvana, which is the freedom of suffering or whatever. But there's a little bit of a very fine difference or distinction that needs to be made there, which is that in the Theravada Buddhist texts, when they talk about their attainment of nirvana, they talk about it literally like suffering ends, but when suffering ends, it's kind of like your consciousness. Imagine that your consciousness is a candle that's burning. You blew the candle out. That's, that's exactly what it says is the description of it. It's, it's kind of like this only makes sense in the context of a past and future lives um, worldview. So let's say that you accept that you have had this stream of consciousness which has been spinning in this cycle of um, death and rebirth and suffering for countless eons. And your goal is to escape the cycle. The only way, killing yourself doesn't do anything because you'll just take rebirth. You'll just be reborn again in a much worse situation because of the karmic repercussions of killing yourself. So the only way to escape the cycle is by attaining nirvana. In, in the Theravada tradition. And in the Theravada tradition, that means to realize, to have a direct realization of your own individual selflessness, which means that your self-identity, the I or me, doesn't truly exist. And they say that when you have the ultimate level of realization of that, it's like the candle representing your stream of consciousness that's been passing through infinite lifetimes goes out. So there's no more rebirth. Now, Mahayana Buddhism does, says that that is a selfish, one-sided attainment of peace, which doesn't help anyone. And so they say that the enlightenment of a Buddha, a fully enlightened Buddha, because in Theravada Buddhism, they say you can't even become a Buddha. They say Buddha's Buddha, and you're you. You're an ordinary person. You can only attain this state of, they have a special term for it, they call arhat. It doesn't really matter. Let's not get into that. But it's, it's a state of high, high realization, the full realization of the selflessness, individual selflessness, that ends your continuity in samsara. But that's not a Buddha. A Buddha is a fully enlightened being who continues working for the benefit of others. And so even though they have attained enlightenment, they're not abiding in this single-sided like cessation state, which is a cessation of their activities and their consciousness and so forth. So what it said is that a Buddha because of their realization of emptiness, their realization of the, tr the absence of independent existence, they no longer abide in samsara. But because of their compassion, they, no longer, they also don't abide in that single-sided state of peace, which they would call nirvana. So that means, that's why they call it non-abiding nirvana. It is the state which d neither abides in samsara, because they're no longer suffering, because they have attained that full realization, which... Um, a realization of emptiness of both oneself and of all phenomena, which means that they're no longer experiencing suffering. Um, they no longer are in that continuity of samsara. But they don't just fall into a state of absence or cessation because the power of their great compassion leads them to continue working for the welfare of others. And so that's what's meant by, you know, and, and where this comes in with needing both the methods and the wisdom. So the first five of the perfections are talked about as the methods. 
and the sixth is wisdom. And so you need both, essentially. Um, if you only want to uh, get a single-sided state of peace, you only need the realization of selflessness. You don't need all these other practices. But if you want to attain Buddhahood for the sake of all beings, if you want to fulfill this um, practice of bodhicitta, if you want to fulfill your aspiration of bodhicitta by doing these engaged practices and fully manifesting that result, then you need the methods and the wisdom. And so, um, and the methods are, you can think of those as aspects of compassion. Um, they are kind of a manifestation, or you could say uh, an aspect of this side of method, which is associated with compassion, as opposed to the side of wisdom, which is that insight into the nature of reality. So um, together, when you bring all those aspects together, the five, the five perfections of method with the sixth perfection of wisdom, then you can attain the state of a Buddha, which is that non-abiding nirvana. So all of that, sorry, that took almost 35 minutes or something. That was just to even frame the conversation about the perfection of generosity because I knew if I just started talking about the perfection of generosity, there's no context. Um, so for some of you who have already been studying these things for many years, you would know what I was talking about. And many other people, there's no, no foundation to even have the, the conversation. So sorry that took so long, and I hope um, that was clear. And we'll have plenty of time for questions later. So please write down questions, and we can, even if you just think that what I'm talking about is crazy nonsense, please just let me know that you think it's crazy nonsense. We can have a discussion. So um, really, uh, nothing is uh, off limits here. We can talk about anything. So one more thing about the, this will be something that applies to all of the um, perfections. They have four essential characteristics. So one is that they will diminish the strength of their contrary factor. What that means is that by practicing generosity, it's going to weaken the strength of your greediness, your covetousness. By um, practicing ethical discipline, it will it will you know, break away or it will decline or diminish the strength of your haphazardness, your kind of like wild, unrestrained conduct. Uh, patience, it will, it will weaken the strength of your anger. Dilig diligence will weaken the strength of your laziness. Meditative concentration will weaken the strength of your distraction. Wisdom will weaken the strength of your ignorance, like that. And so the next is that they will bring you to a state of non-conceptual timeless awareness. This is more like lofty lingo for they will bring you to the realization, direct realization of reality, or they will lead you to have this full understanding of that lack of independent existence, the, the perfection of wisdom. The next is they will fulfill all wishes perfectly. So essentially by doing all of these practices, they're going to fulfill the wishes of you and others. So if you're doing them in the way that they are prescribed, like basically they're going to, if you are a person who is practicing proper ethical, ethical restraint and patience and enthusiasm and all these kind of things, then you're going to be a much more like helpful person in the world. It's also going to, for example, it's going to, you're going to encounter a lot less problems for yourself and others. Like you're not going to be creating problems from, for yourself and others. If you are practicing with ethical restraint, you're practicing with compassion, you're being generous, you're going to gather a lot more of a support network. A lot more people are going to want to help you. And you're going to be creating a lot less enemies and a lot less problems for yourself, even in your own head. Like if you are, if you're cheating on your partner, if you're lying to people, this is all creating a whole world, a whole web of suspicion and doubt and regret and all kinds of negative emotions in your mind. And so basically, um, you know, this, it says the, the line literally just says fulfills all wishes perfectly. But basically, essentially what that means is it's going to make you a better vessel for accomplishing your own happiness and the happiness of other people. And the last is it brings beings to spiritual maturity. And so what that means is that by you going through those practices and developing yourself, you're going to be a more capable person for helping others to mature themselves on some kind of spiritual path. And so if something, if you're practicing something and you like think that it is a um, perfection or you're trying to practice the perfection of generosity, it should be doing those things. You know, if your generosity is not contributing to the weakening of your greediness or your covetousness or your miserliness, then you're, there's something missing. There, you know, you should re-examine the way you're practicing, something like that.